Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Carolyn McCreary. I am Township Manager for Montgomery Township. Uh, the reason we are hosting this informal meeting today um, via Microsoft Teams is because uh, we decided that our business development partnership group that we can give the community some information um, needed very much today concerning the CARES Act. As you know, this is a constantly evolving situation with additional guidance and new laws and rules being added almost every day. Although we will be opening up to a question and answer period toward the end of our time together, any questions about your specific situation or towards your business in particular might be better left to a private conversation. Contact information for each of today's panelists is provided on the screen. So the COVID pandemic has caused significant The COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant and deep economic trouble to many area businesses. The CARES Act and supplemental acts of Congress were passed to help businesses cope with the massive economic impact that the shutdown of the U.S. economy has caused. I do need to say that the panelists today will be discussing the topics around the CARES Act. And if you have specific questions, um, once again, please feel free to reach out to them and their contact information is on the screen. I am pleased to introduce T.R. Johns, who is Vice President and Relationship Manager in Business Banking for M&T Bank. He works with privately owned small businesses in the Philadelphia five county area with a primary focus on Montgomery, Delaware and Chester counties. TR is a resident of Chalfont for the last 20 years. David Peritz has 25 years of diversified public accounting experience. His background includes many years with two national accounting firms prior to joining Herbine & Company Inc. in 2012. He has extensive experience in accounting for healthcare professionals, wholesale and retail businesses, real estate entities, and construction companies. He's in charge of Herbine's COVID-19 task force and has presented on many aspects dealing with the stimulus bills recently passed. J.P. Northrup is a financial advisor with Edward Jones located within Montgomery Township on Bethlehem Pike. He has lived in our township for over 18 years with his wife and two sons who both attend Montgomery Elementary. He will be our panelist discussing the financial impact on employees and what the CARES Act means for those laid off or furloughed. Additionally, J.P. is one of the co-chairs of our business development partnership. He is also on our Autumn Fest committee and he also is a regular attender of our finance committee meetings. So thank you gentlemen for joining us. Hello, is everybody uh, unmuted? Yes. Uh, I am. I, I'm not sure if we lost TR or not. He was going to go first. Yeah, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Go ahead, TR. OK, I apologize for uh, I, I was cutting in and out there, my my connection. Um, so I, I didn't hear everything there. But uh, again, my name is T.R. Johns. I'm with M&T Bank and our business banking group. Um, my primary focus is Montgomery, Chester and Delaware counties in the small business community hand handling um, any and all banking needs. Um, just to, to give a, a brief overview, the, 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 the CARES Act um, included uh, the payroll, the Paycheck Protection Program that was designed to provide incentives for small businesses to keep their employees on payroll. 
um, and it is a, a an emergency loan program that will forgive the loans if uh, all and certain requirements are met by the employers, uh, primarily that employees are kept on the payroll for um, at least eight weeks and the money is used primarily for payroll, uh, certain percentages for payroll and the rest can be used for rent, mortgage interest or utilities. There have been numerous um, updates to this program. Um, most recently that um, the eight week covered period uh, for payroll has been extended to 24 weeks. Um, and um, that is the, the the primary change that that has come out most recently. Keep in mind these these changes have been coming fast and and furious over the, since the the program uh, was put in place, um, and uh, we are now at that point in time where customers uh, and small business owners will will begin applying for forgiveness on the. Uh, on any approved PPP loans. Um, and this is where, in, in my opinion, uh, a lot of the the real heavy lifting will, will come into play in documenting um, the use of funds that, that will enable people to be uh, approved by the SBA, hopefully for forgiveness um, uh, down the line. So we're, we're beginning uh, to collect data now as lenders. Um, Business owners are compiling, uh, along with their 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 counsel, uh, beginning to compile that that data to support what they need to to apply for the forgiveness uh, portion of that. Can everyone still hear me? Yep, I think okay, uh, great. We'll, we'll pass over to Dave. If Dave, are you available to talk about more of the, uh, the tax implications in the, the, from the accounting side? Uh, yes, so there's, there's really not a whole lot of tax implications um, on the PPP loan. The, uh, the forgiveness of the loan doesn't create taxable income. Um, however, you're not allowed to deduct any of the expenses that you're using your PPP loan proceeds for. So that being said, it kind of negates the uh, the tax exempt income aspect of it. Um, but I just wanted to quickly talk about the loan application in itself and some updates that uh, I'm informing a lot of our clients as well as uh, different various industries. So if I may, I'm going to try to share my screen. And hopefully everyone can successfully see this. So again, we always put disclaimers on everything because the uh, the law keeps uh, evolving and changing. So as of today, um, I'm going to give you the most updated information, but it is subject to change. Um, if there's any guidance or any law enactments that uh, may be passed in the near future. So I wanted to quickly go through the history of the PPP uh, loan program. So on March 13th, there was a uh, federal emergency declared on, Mar on March 13th, and on March 27th, uh, there was the enactment of the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, commonly known as the CARES Act. This was a $349 billion federally guaranteed loan program uh, designed for small businesses. The April 3rd was the enrollment, the beginning that people could start applying for the PPP loans. Within 14 days of that uh, enrollment, the money was gone. $349 billion um, was dispersed out to small and medium sized businesses and it went away. On these various states, uh, both US Treasury and SBA, uh, were continuing to issue out guidance and changing the rules pertaining to these uh, PPP loan program. Then on April 15th, they passed their first interim final rule, and that is SBA's uh, way of issuing out guidance on this SBA 
uh, program through, the, through both SBA and the Department of Treasury. They then later, uh, after April 15th, issued out 15 additional interim final rules. Uh, April 21st, they passed the Enactment Act, the Enactment Act which uh, provided an additional $310 billion to the PPP program. And as we sit today, there are still residual funds left from that second funding. Um, I believe the last time I saw, which was uh, at the end of May, there was a little bit over $100 billion left uh, for funding. So if any small business hasn't obtained those funds and is economically harmed by this pandemic and is interested, I implore you to you know, take a look at it and see if you could apply for these funds, if they will help you. Um, then on May 3rd, 5th, 6th, 13th, um, there were additional guidance in form of FAQs that were issued, and I believe we're up to the number 48, which the last one was issued on May 19th. And then on April 28th, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives passed the Flexibility Act, which then was passed by Senate and on this past Friday was signed into law by President Trump. This law had changed a lot of what we had uh, known about the PPP loan program. The, the money had to be spent over an eight week cover period. You can uh, do that now over a 24 week period. However, you can still elect to have those funds spent over that eight week period. The funds had to be spent in a ratio of 75% for payroll costs and 25% for non-payroll costs. The new enactment of the Flexibility Act had changed that to now it, you can use it as a 60% for payroll costs and 40% for non-payroll costs. U.S. Treasury defines non-payroll costs as rent, utilities, and interest. So as long as you spend the money on rent, utilities, and interest, and these are for uh, contracts that were in place prior to uh, February 15, 2020. So that February 15, 2020, that's the date that the uh, federal government determined pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So if you had a lease arrangement in place prior to February 15, 2020 for rent, for example, that rent that you can now use with your PPP loan uh, will qualify for forgiveness, again, using that uh, either that 75-25 split, if you want to elect on um, the old rules or the 60-40 split um, under the new rules under the Flexibility Act. So they also changed the definition of the cover period again from the eight weeks to 24 weeks, but they also uh, introduced what is now uh, called an alternative payroll cover period. That election, if you do decide to do that, you can elect to start your payroll cover period on the date that you first run payroll after you have been funded with the PPP loan proceeds. So again, this application changed that because we were all in the impression that you had eight weeks to spend the money on the date that you received it. And a lot of people were either in the middle of a payroll cycle. So this kind of provided a lot more flexibility with people that wanted to explore that. The, this is a quick snapshot of what the loan forgiveness application looks like on the first page. And as you can see in the highlighted area, um, you can either do the cover period or you can elect to use your alternative payroll cover period. They originally discussed that any expenses had to be both paid and incurred in order to qualify for forgiveness. The loan application when it was on when it was released by both SBA and Department of Treasury, they changed it to now it's more like paid or incurred during that uh, eight week period. So again, this is a lot of complexities to it. And I uh, ask that, you know, if you have any questions, you know, you can feel free to reach out to me or talk to your accountant about it. But um, this was a big change because we needed both uh, the cost to be both paid and incurred during that eight week period. And again, this is now changed a lot more flexible um, because you can either pay expenses during that eight week cover period or it can be incurred in that eight week cover period as long as it's paid shortly thereafter the, the cover period ends. They define non-payroll expenses to be paid by the next billing cycle. So for example, if you have a utility bill, you just have to pay your utility bill if it falls 
if the payment date falls after that cover period, but was incurred during the cover period, you just have to pay that bill by the next billing cycle, the next month's bill. So here was what the PPP Schedule A worksheet looks like. You, it's very simple, uh, looks easy, but there's a lot of complexities to it. You have to fill out your employee's name, their identification number, which is in essence their social security number, cash compensation, average FTE, which I can literally spend an hour just talking about the FTE calculation, but we don't have time for that. And then there's a salary and hourly wage reduction. So uh, the premise of the average FTE and the salary and wage reduction is this. So I'll boil it down real quick. There is in essence three limitations uh, for the forgiveness to determine if all of this loan will be either fully forgiven or partially forgiven. First, you have to spend it again in that, you know, 60% for payroll cost and 40% for non-payroll cost. The next limitation is FTEs, which stands for full-time equivalents. So what SBA and US Treasury, they want you to look at two periods before the pandemic started, and they want you to calculate what your average uh, hours are for both your full-time employees and your part-time employees. And then they want you to compare it right now as you're spending the money. If there's a reduction compared to the pre-pandemic periods and you, you have two periods to look at and you wanna pick the one that has the lesser of uh, the FTE ca calculation. So when you compare it, if there is a reduction, you will lose some of your forgiveness. However, there is a safe harbor provision in this where if you don't, have, if you have a reduction in FTEs, you can restore that to June 30th. But under that enactment act, uh, or the flexibility act that was just recently passed, now we have, you can elect to do it as late as December 31st. So if you restore your employees back to work, um, similar to what it was pre-pandemic, you're fine. You won't lose some of that forgiveness. The, sal the salary and hourly wage reduction is a calculation to determine if you have reduced your employees' compensation by more than 25%. If you haven't, and they're getting paid similar to what they were pre-pandemic, there is no uh, loss of forgiveness. If there is a more than 25% reduction, then you'll start to eat into that forgiveness and it will trigger um, the loan. So again, these are the three basic limitations to this, and they are a little bit complex. And again, um, you should discuss this with either your, your accountant or your legal counsel, or again, feel free to contact me and I'd be very happy to, to talk a little bit further into it. Um, I have some slides to talk about how to compute the FTEs, but again, because of uh, limited time, I'll just briefly touch on it. The It's calculated based on a 40 hour work week uh, so if somebody works uh, 30 hours, it's basically three quarters of a FTE equivalent. Um, you are supposed to round it to the nearest tenth. So in this case, it wouldn't be 0.75. If you were to round up, it would be 0.8. Um, you could also make an election to treat all of your part timers at 0.5. So again, you have to evaluate if this election helps you or hurts you. So again, it's it's a mathematical equation that you have to go through. There are calculators out there. Um, we have a calculator for us internally, but uh, again, you should evaluate whether to use the calculator based on uh, dividing it to the closest tenth of a of a percent, um, or use make the election to just use all your part timers at 0.5 uh, half a, half an FT account. Uh, again, I just have some quick. Uh, examples of how to go through. Um, I won't uh, go into this because I have very brief time. This presentation that I have up here um, is an hour and a half long and I'm trying to condense it into 20 minutes, so I apologize, but I'm trying to get this information out to everybody as quickly as possible. Um, again, just salary reduction. Uh, you have to restore it. Uh, again, uh, you have an ability to restore that uh, if you do have a salary reduction. And here is the, uh, again, another page on the application, which uh, you literally put your payroll cost and you put your FTE reduction calculation and it'll calculate what your limitation is for the FTEs. And there are uh, some exceptions to the FTE reduction. 
if you make a good faith effort to ask an employee to come back to work and they do not come back because they're either making more money on unemployment, they want to come back, that won't harm you for your FTE calculation. Same thing if you terminated employment with one of your uh, one of your employees or somebody retired, um, voluntary resignation, uh, things along those lines. So with that being said, um, if anybody has any questions on this forgiveness application or just general questions on how this works, again, feel free to contact me um, or JR. Uh, you know, again, this is a great program. If you haven't uh, explored it yet and you feel that you'll qualify and you were economically harmed by the pandemic, um, you should contact your financial institution and uh, your accountant and decide if this is really a great uh, vehicle for you. So with that, I'd like to hand the presentation back over. Hey, thanks, Dave. Um, my name is uh, JP Northrup. Uh, as was said, I'm a financial advisor here in the township. Uh, one of the, the last aspects that we wanted to kind of cover is the impact that the CARES Act has on uh, the individual employees for uh, different businesses. Uh, obviously, a lot of people um, were either laid off or furloughed, and uh, some business owners would like to reach back out to those employees, uh, not just to bring them back when the time is ready, but uh, to maybe help them out a little bit and let them know about this, uh, some of this, this other information. Uh, one of the biggest provisions that the CARES Act provides is a new hardship withdrawal uh, that would allow uh, people prior to turning 59 and a half uh, access to some of their retirement money. Now, in the past, there were really only three hardship withdrawals that would be allowed without penalty. It was uh, for uh, any kind of um, uh, educational expense, uh, if you had medical expenses that exceeded 10% of your income, or if you were uh, use, using money towards the purchase of a first-time home. Uh, the CARES Act introduced a fourth hardship provision, and that is the uh, allowing people who have been affected, not necessarily infected with COVID-19, but affected by the pandemic, uh, allowing them to access some of uh, this this uh, this money in these assets. Uh, it is limited to 100% or $100,000, uh, the lesser of the two. You do have, the employees do have the ability to get that money back in to their retirement account uh, over the next three years. So if they're temporarily laid off or furloughed, they need some access to cash, they use their retirement account, then they come back to work. Maybe they haven't used all that money or maybe uh, they've saved some of it up. They have up to three years to get that money back into whether it's a 401k or an IRA. Um, the taxes, because this is uh, usually a traditional 401k or IRA, taxes will need to be paid, but they can be spread out over three years as well. So either the money gets back in or the taxes get spread out over, uh, over three years. Uh, a scenario that we, we sometimes use is let's say someone takes 60,000 out, uh, they'll pay taxes on 20,000 in the first year and then pay taxes on 20,000 in the, the second year. But let's say by 2022, uh, they have the ability to get uh, that 60,000, they can put that 60,000 back in. So they can put that 60,000 in and then go and amend their taxes for 2020 and 2021 and get that tax money back. Now, I will recommend that, that before anyone uses this hardship provision, uh, that they reach out to an advisor to make sure that uh, this is kind of a last case scenario. Uh, we do not like the idea of people cannibalizing their retirement assets 
uh, before uh, they're actually in retirement. So it's nice to know that these options are there, but I but it should be used kind of in a, in a last case, worst case scenario. There are a couple other provisions uh, in the CARES Act that pertain to uh, suspension of, um, of mortgages, mortgage payments for a temporary uh, period, uh, moratorium on foreclosures and evictions. Those, however, only pertain to properties that are mortgaged under some sort of federal um, uh, guidelines. So if it's a Fannie Mae uh, mortgage uh, or anything like that. Privately held mortgages, the federal government cannot stipulate uh, that certain foreclosures uh, need to be suspended or anything like that. So for employees or for people who have lost their jobs, uh, one of the things that they'll need to do is take a look at who holds their mortgage and see whether they qualify uh, for a temporary suspension on, on payments. Uh, the last thing that I will bring up, and this is more for, the, uh, for, for people who are already in retirement, there was a suspension of the 2020 RMDs. Uh, these are the required minimum distributions that people have. Typically, in your early 70s, the government starts telling you you have to take money out of your IRAs um, and 401ks. That has been suspended in 2020 because the government doesn't want to force people to sell off or sell out of assets that had dropped significantly in that pullback that we saw in, in February and March. So from, from the individual's point of view, those are kind of the, the major uh, topics that uh, we think a lot of the, the people uh, and, and business owners in the, uh, in the area uh, need to convey to, to their employees as well. So I will pass the ball back to, I believe, Carolyn. Thank you, JP, and thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Um, this is going to be um, posted on the Township's YouTube channel, and we hope that everybody found it valuable. And um, just everyone stay safe and continue to follow the guidelines, even though we're all chomping at the bit to resume what was our normal lives. It's just really important that we do what we need to for everybody's benefit. So thank you again, everyone, for attending this, and, for, and a special thanks to our panelists. Oh, and if I could just jump in real quick, we do have one question for the panelists. Um, we have a question from David by Folco, and he asks, the time to use the PPP has been extended from eight to 24 weeks. Does that mean if business doesn't pick up, we should apply for more PPP before June 30th? So I'm a little, I guess confused about the question when you say more you've already been fun I guess I'm, I'm asking if you've already been funded and are looking for additional proceeds or you're looking to spend the money at this point if you're looking to spend the money you can either do it over the eight week cover period um, you can elect to do that or you can spend the money over what is now um, under the new rules under the 24 week period and I think we've lost Dave, I think we've lost uh, TR to, uh, to another conference call, but uh, if, if a small business received a loan but maybe didn't, you know, didn't get the maximum loan, could they reapply or apply for an additional loan? So if you applied under prior guidance that restricted how much you initially applied for and under new guidance um, gives you the ability, you would have had the ability of obtaining additional PPP funds. Yes, you can ask for an increase. Uh, the guidance that was issued uh, relating to that, there was a little bit of ambiguity when it dealt with uh, partners and uh, super proprietors. So they did clarify that, but it was clarified after the fact. And they said that if you didn't receive the full PPP funds that under the new guidance that you could have received, you could ask for an increase of, of funds. 
And David does um, clarify here in the chat that he did already receive the money. OK, great. So un if, if under new calculations, if you can receive additional funds, you should contact your financial institution, your banker uh, you talk to and uh, let them know the situation that you're in and see if you can uh, either fill out a, another application or, or if there's some mechanism that you can ask for additional funds. OK, great, thank you. Um, and then we really only have one other question um, and someone anonymous, anonymously asked if the slides will be available. I already reached out to Dave in the chat and he provided a website that everyone can go to if they'd like more information, including the slides. Um, it's live in the Q&A area. It's www.urbine.com. Well, that's it for the questions. Well, thank you all for uh, for joining us. Uh, I think Carolyn has our contact information up. If, uh, as we stipulated at the beginning, if there's something specific to your situation uh, or to your employees, uh, reach out to your small business association, commercial banker, to your accountant, uh, to your advisor, if you uh, financial advisor, if you do have any questions uh, that you want to direct towards us. Uh, feel free to reach out to us as well. But thank you all very much for uh, for for joining us. Um, Business Development Partnership uh, is continuing to meet, even though we uh, have to do it virtually now. Uh, so hopefully, at some point in the not so distant future, we'll be able to uh, continue to to get together here in in Montgomery Township. Uh, if you're interested in uh, participating in our meetings feel free to reach out to me directly and I will let you know when our meetings are held, uh, either virtually or, or in person. Thanks again, gentlemen. Thank you all. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you.